While the Pexong gun was quickly adopted by navies, the same wasn't true of the other major invention that would transform warships, steam power. There was resistance to change. There was a, a natural skepticism towards new technological breakthroughs. And you could see that with the arrival of steam. Changes in mentalities, ways of thinking, don't happen at the same rate as technological changes. There can be relatively quick technological changes, but then people have to adapt. The first steam engine was installed in a boat in 1807. With 18 horsepower, it operated two enormous paddle wheels. The invention of steam power was applied at sea by an American, Fulton, giving more power. And he made the first steamboats with a range that made them useful for trade or for war. In 1838, an English liner powered by both sail and steam made the crossing from Liverpool to New York in a record time, 15 days instead of the 40 days needed by other sailing ships. In spite of this exploit, the great naval powers were slow to adopt steam. You immediately think, steam, that's it. No, no. Perfecting it took a very long time. It was complicated. First of all, you needed different types of people on board. You needed mechanics, you needed people who worked in forges, people in the iron trade. The steam engine was a complicated and delicate mechanism which raised questions over vulnerability and fuel stocks. For the military use of steam, the major obstacle was the protection of the ship, because the external wheels providing the propulsion were extremely vulnerable to enemy artillery. But there was another problem. In the holds, they needed enormous stores of coal. So they not only needed space in the holds for that, which was to the detriment of the cannons, but they also needed external infrastructure, places to pick up coal around the world. Another revolutionary invention solved the problem of vulnerability, the propeller. Located below the waterline, it was protected from enemy fire. It quickly appealed to naval commanders. Every warship is now driven by propeller. It allows them to travel at remarkable speeds. The problem is that they generate considerable noise, which can be picked up by enemy submarines using their sonar. They have antennae, which try to detect the presence of mechanical objects, such as boats, among the sounds of the sea. Civilian boats can be detected from far away because their priority isn't to avoid detection by submarines. On the other hand, on the Frem frigate, the hull has been specially designed to limit the noise of water flowing off the hull. The stabilizers have been removed, and a much quieter method of stabilizing the ship is used. The engines obviously have to run, and the pumps cause vibration. All that sound is insulated from the hull in order to reduce the noise emitted by the ship. Engineers have also worked on the shape of the propeller. Its hydrodynamic qualities make this ship even quieter. It was a French engineer, Stanislas Dupuis de Lome, who designed the first warship in the world to be driven by steam and propeller, the Napoleon. Five years after its launch, it demonstrated its 500 horsepower in the Crimean War, when the Russian Navy faced the French and English navies. People understood the usefulness of steam power when the Napoleon gave a tow to the flagship, the Ville de Paris, which wasn't a traditional three-masted ship, so only driven by sail, because there wasn't much wind and the currents were against it. And the British were stuck at the entry to the Dardanelles because they didn't have a sufficiently powerful steamship. It was a brilliant demonstration of the superiority of steam over sail. Uniquement à voile. 
This exploit removed the French Navy's reticence with regard to steam power. In 1855, a committee met and said, a warship that isn't steam-powered isn't a warship. So a page was turned. It didn't mean that all sailing ships were got rid of. But it did mean that people from then on considered that steam was essential to the operation of a warship. In 1855, a new type of ship was introduced. Continuing its experimentation, France constructed an ironclad platform armed with 50-pounder Pixon guns. It was called the Floating Battery. It was called the Floating Battery, as they couldn't call it a frigate or a corvette or anything else, because these were ships with no nautical qualities at all. It was a sort of fortress on water. It was a big ironclad shoebox which fired guns, and that was it. It had no form. It wasn't a ship of the line. It wasn't a ship. Let's be honest about it. During the Crimean War, three floating batteries were towed to face the fortress of Kinber. On the 17th of October, 1855, they reduced the fortress to ashes in four hours. For their part, the floating batteries sustained little damage in spite of being hit by 126 shells. This success confirmed the intuitions of the engineer, Stanislaus Dupuis de Lome. Dupuis de Lome was a brilliant young naval engineer. He was sent to England several times to observe British technological progress. He was struck by the achievements of the British steel industry. And in 1845, he proposed the idea of an entirely ironclad frigate. This new type of ship was launched on the 8th of March, 1859. It was the first ironclad in the world. Its name was Gloire. It was a ship that was extraordinarily technologically advanced, such that for about 20 years, France was ahead of England in naval architecture, which was rarely the case. The Gloire marked a break with the past because it was a combination of three types of innovation, which were, one, artillery with exploding shells, two, propeller-driven propulsion, and three, armour plating. The Gloire brought to an end three centuries of domination by sailing ships, and the age of the ironclad started. These steel warlords would rule the seas until the start of the Second World War.